Thank you. Um, as Elizabeth was saying, I'd like to tell you about a research project, something, something I did a few years ago, but it's an ongoing, ongoing project, and you'll see it, it's going to go on for many years in the future, we hope. Um, let me just do this. There. Almost everything we know about ancient Egypt comes from their belief in life after death. Um, it may surprise you. You know, you, you've all seen temples. You've all seen the tombs. We don't have cities. The ancient Egyptian cities weren't meant to last forever. They, they really believe that you're going to go on forever, so why not put your money in your tombs and your temples, which are for eternity? So their houses only had to last one generation. So we don't have ancient Egyptian cities, just temples, tombs, and artifacts from those tombs. Now, the only reason we have coffins is because they wanted to protect the body for eternity. Now, the, the notion that they had was resurrection. The Egyptians believed not in reincarnation, as some New Agers say, but in resurrection. They believed that the body was literally going to get up and go again in the next world, and that's why you had to preserve it. So it was the ultimate thing to preserve your body. Now, if one coffin won't work, you could have plans B and C, right? If one is d damaged, then you go to another one. Now, I think the origin of this belief that, th that the body doesn't have to perish comes from their earliest burials. You are looking at a burial of a man that's approximately 5,000 years old probably older. It's a natural mummification. Nothing has been done to preserve this body. It has simply been buried in the hot Egyptian sand. You can also see from the grave goods there's some belief in immortality at this stage. Perhaps he needs some of these things in the next world, so he's buried with some of his possessions. This is a natural mummy. Nothing done to preserve it at all. This is an artificial mummy. This is one that is preserved intentionally. Now, why do an intentional mummification if the natural mummification works so well? The answer is, when you bury somebody in a, a sand pit, it dehydrates the body quickly. And that's the key to preservation. If you can get rid of the moisture in a body quickly, it won't decay because bacteria need moisture. This is why, for example, you know, when you, when you have these cereals with blueberries in them, you know, these dehydrated blueberries, it's really the mummy of a blueberry, right? It's been dehydrated, and, 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 and it's preserved that way because bacteria won't act upon it. Now, eventually, though, these sand pit burials, the sand would blow away, and animals could get at the body. So the Egyptians decided we need something better. That's when they started cutting tombs in the rock beneath the sand. But that removes the sand from the body, and the body started to decay because the hot sand didn't dehydrate it quickly. So then they had to go to artificial mummification. And this is an artificial mummy. It's Ramses the Great. Right? Um, the amazing thing about mummies, and I think part of the thing that fascinates people with mummies, is that they're recognizable human beings. If you knew Ramses the Great 3,500 years ago, you'd recognize him. I mean, he still looks like Ramses the Great. So artificial mummification is the way that the Egyptians decided to preserve their bodies. Now, the curious thing is that Egyptians were a nation of accountants. They wrote down everything. I mean everything. They wrote down how many people they killed in battles. They wrote down laundry lists. We have, I can tell you the names of Ramses' horses, right? The names of the two horses that pulled his chariot to the Battle of Kadesh, right? Mood is content and victory in Thebes is their names. Um, so I can tell you almost everything about the Egyptians from what they wrote down, but they never wrote down how to mummify a human cadaver. Never. It was probably a trade secret. So if you're going to try to figure out how they mummified, you, there, are, there are various ways to go at it, but you're not going to find that papyrus that says, do this, do this, do that. One of the things, see, I became interested in mummification when I started reading, I started reading books about mummification, ancient Egypt, written by, written by Egyptologists. And I knew they were wrong. They just didn't sound right the way they said it. But even more important, there were questions that were never answered. For example, think about this. If you're going to dehydrate a body quickly, do you drain the blood? Nobody ever talks about that. Um, they used, as you know, many of you know, they used natrin, a, a naturally occurring compound of sodium carbonate, sodium bicarbonate, and sodium chloride baking soda and salt. It's really a mixture. How much do you need to preserve a human body? Nobody ever asked. 
So there were a lot of unanswered questions and certain things that didn't seem right, and eventually I decided the only way we're going to answer these questions is to actually do a mummification. So almost 14 years ago now, I decided we were going to mummify a human cadaver. Now, I wanted as much information as I could get before doing the mummification, and the kinds of things I looked at were tomb paintings. There's, there's, there's only two tombs that show a mummy in the process of not necessarily the physical mummification, but something else. What you're looking at is, is the tomb of Hoy, H-U-Y, and he was an embalmer. And on his tomb wall, he did a painting of his embalmer's workshop. Now, it doesn't show the actual mummification. It shows the wrapping, but it's instructive. There's, there's a couple of things that really make sense and I, and I thought were quite interesting. For example, if you look carefully, it's not on a table. The mummy isn't on a table. It's on blocks. Now, the reason for that, and anybody who's worked with cadavers and knows, if, if you're doing wrapping, you don't want to have to lift it off the table all the time that you pass a bandage underneath. So if you've got it on blocks, you can simply pass your bandage around the mummy. And so that rang true. I'm looking at this painting and saying, this guy knew what he was talking about. This is realistic. Now, another thing that people, you know, certainly every sixth grader knows, that the brain was removed through the nose, right? And, and very often they poured resin into the cranium through the nasal passages. Well, what Hoy is showing us on his tomb painting are the tools that they used. For example, this, it's in a funny perspective, but what it is is a ceramic vessel with two tubes, and they would put that in the nostrils and pour the resin in through that. So we're looking at ancient Egyptian embalming tomb. Now here is a pan in which they would put the heated resin, and they'd put a little on a cup. And, and one of the men is bending over, and he's got a cup, and he's brushing the resin on the bandages to make them stick. So one of the things I looked at was tomb paintings to see what I could get. Now, another thing I looked at was Herodotus, who was a Greek tourist around 450 BC in Egypt, who went to Egypt. He never saw a mummification, never saw one, but he was told how they did it. And he has details. He says they removed the brain with an iron hook, right? He also says they made an incision on the left flank, right? Um, so all of this is background for what I'm going to do. Now, this is, a, is, is not a mummification. It's the last ritual performed before the mummy is put in the tomb. It's called the opening of the mouth ceremony. Now, the official, right, who's on the left, He's actually the son of the deceased, actually acting as a priest. Has an implement, it's an adze, it's a, it's a woodworking tool. And he's touching it to the mouth of the deceased. And he's saying a prayer. He's going to say, you are young again, you live again, you are young again, you live again forever. Now by doing this, the mummy, when it resurrects in the next world, will be able to speak and have breath right, and live again. And the, it's interesting, the, the hieroglyphs over there, talk about the opening of the mouth ceremony, it says, for the Osiris and the man's name, Senefer. Now, this is a papyrus. It's a book of the dead. And this is what every Egyptian wanted to be buried with. It's your instructions for how to get to the next world. It's magical spells. It's not a book in the sense of having a beginning, a middle, and an end. It's just a bunch of magical spells to have power in your legs, to have this, to have that. And what you've got here is the deceased and his wife are in a, in a, in a position of adoration and they're standing in front of Osiris, the god of the dead. And they are asking him, admit me into the next world. Now, where is the next world? It's in the West. The reason it's in the West is because the sun dies in the West every day and is reborn in the East. So the West became associated with the dead. So, for example, when you died, you know, they had all kinds of euphemisms, just like we do today. We don't talk about the deceased. We say he's dearly departed, right? Like he's going on a trip, the dearly departed. Um, they called the dead people Westerners. Right? And when somebody died, they said, he went west. Right? But this is a book of the dead. And this is a recreation of what a mummification must have looked like. Uh, this is my, these, are my stu these are our students in our drama department at Long Island University. Um, it's interesting. We have one guy who plays Anubis, the, the jackal-headed god. He's got an Anubis mask on. And the reason he got that part was he didn't want to shave his head right, for, the, for the thing. Um, priests shaved their heads, and he just didn't want to do it, so we put the mask on him. Uh, the jackal was the god of embalming, Anubis, and there's a reason for that. Jackals have unusual digestive systems. 
They can't digest fresh meat. They prefer pre-digested protein, rotted meat. So they used to prowl cemeteries, and then they became associated with the cemetery and the dead. So the jackal becomes the god of mummification. There he is. Now, when we decided to do a mummification, we agreed we would do everything in the ancient Egyptian way. We would do nothing modern at all. And the first thing is to gather your ingredients and your tools and everything. And let me emphasize this. It took a very large team working behind me to get this project underway. Um, we had tool makers. We had, I mean, all kinds of people helped on this thing. And it started here. This doesn't look like Egypt to you, I know, but this is in Egypt. And it's a place called the Wadi Natrun, the, the, the Valley of the Natrun. Now, natrun is the substance that all Egyptians used to dehydrate the body. Right? And as I say, it's basically baking soda and table salt. It occurs naturally in the soil. And the white stuff that you see around the, the, the shore of the lake, that's the natron. And that's where the ancient Egyptians got their natron, and that's where I went to dig my natron. Now, I'm, I've got a little baggie here. I'm getting a little baggie of it just because I want to do a chemical analysis to make sure I'm getting the right stuff. Right? So I took the baggie, and we had analysis, and sure enough, it's natron. Um, so then I had to bring the natron back to the United States. And probably the hardest part of my entire research project here was bringing 400 pounds of an unidentified white powder through JFK. <laughs> yeah, but I, got, I got lucky. I really did. National Geographic was doing a documentary on this, and they had all their camera equipment, you know, 22 silver boxes, you know, with all the camera gear, and I just stuck my natron in with their stuff, and it went through. Uh, so I don't get any grief. Now, one of the things we had to do was replicate the tools. Now, Herodotus said, Herodotus said, they used a stone knife, a stone knife. Now, why a stone knife? They had, they had bronze tools in, in, in Egypt. Why a stone knife? My feeling was it was part of an ancient ritual. In the old days, when they didn't have metal tools, they used stone or something like that. I was wrong, dead wrong. That's where you learn things. This is somebody in Arizona who's skilled at flaking obsidian, volcanic glass, right? And what we did, we had him flake blades for us. This is one of his to sort of, this is a fancy one with a little notch and stuff where he's sort of doing, look what I can do. Um, it's serrated. This is the real thing that you use. It's a simple obsidian flake, and it is very, very sharp. Now, by very, very sharp, I mean that the obsidian edge is one-sixth the thickness of a surgical scalpel. It is better than surgical steel, far better. And as a matter of fact, now, we, we use this in our surgery, and I was amazed. I'm used to scalpels, you know, regular surgical scalpels. When I use this thing, it cuts so quickly, I had to relearn touch, just because I would go right through the thing. So this is fabulous, and, and it does much less damage in surgery. You don't get these serrated tears. Um, and now surgeons are using obsidian scalpels. They're much better than, than, than surgical steel. Uh, so we use this. So I was wrong when I thought the reason they used stone was they just archaic reason, you know, some, some religious ritual. No, it's the best possible tool you could use. So I was going to operate, do, do the surgery with obsidian. Now, this is an important tool. Egyptologists had written about this for nearly a century. They had found them in tombs, and it was called by one Egyptologist the necrotome, the death knife. Now, the thought was this. When you remove the internal organs, it's done through a slit that's only about four inches long. And if you're working in a slit, you know, you're getting the stomach, the liver, the intestines, you're reaching in, and you can only work with one hand. You can only get one hand inside. How are you going to get, you know, real taut, get it taut enough to cut? So some people thought that these knives must be embalmer's knives, that this notch that you see, they would hook it around an organ and pull tightly and, and that way free it. We tried this. It doesn't work at all. Not at all. Um, they, this, is, this is actually some other tool, but it isn't for embalming. But we made them. This is when we made a replica to use. These are other replica tools, copper, bronze. They don't work either. No. We tried it. It doesn't work. It was obsidian that was the key. But we had all these tools made. And, and our tools were made in the ancient Egyptian way. It's the same formula, 88% copper, 12% tin, Beaten, not poured. You can't pour a copper mold and get a sharp edge. You have to beat it, folding it over and over like a samurai sword. Um, so we did all of that, um, but we didn't need that. This is a tool that was useful because if you're going in with one hand, getting out organs, you might want to reach high up, get out the lungs, you know, things like that if you can't get your arm all the way up. So we're using this. Another tool. I'll show you the most important, though, this one. 
Herodotus said they took out the brain with a hooked iron tool, right? And this is what we were going to use. Now, the way that everybody said the brain comes out is as follows. The body is lying on its back. You go in through the nasal passage, breaking past the bone called the cribriform plate, and you're into the cranium rather easily. Right? It's, it's on a larger bone called the ethnoid bone. Now, ethnoid is Greek for sieve. right? Ethnos, it's a sieve because it's honeycombed. And what happens is you go into the, into the cranial cavity, and with this hook at the end, you pull out a little bit of the brain each time, and you keep doing that till the brain comes out completely. Doesn't work. We tried it. Um, when we went down, I did this at the University of Maryland Medical School. I, I was given some cadavers to practice on, actually severed heads. Um, when, when, you know, when, when, when a body is given to a medical school, you want to get the most possible use out of the, out of the cadaver. You want to really put it to good use. So, for example, often the bodies are sectioned. And orthopedic surgeons will get the knees. Plastic surgeons will get the heads. And they'll work out different techniques on cadavers rather than on patients. You know, it's, it's, it's better that way. So I was given two severed heads on which the plastic surgeons had worked that are kind of a little distorted, but um, they had the brain intact. And you cannot get a brain out this way. You cannot. I'll tell you how I did it later. But, but this was the tool we used to remove the brain. This is the tool we would use. And these are all replicas of tools that we'd found in tombs. To, to break through the ethnoid bone, to go through the nasal passages and break through. We had, you know, it, was, it was kind of interesting. As I started doing this project, everybody sensed it was a bit of history. Nobody had mummified a cadaver in 2,000 years. And everybody wanted to participate. So I was almost forced to find jobs for people you know, so they could participate, like my students. For example, the, the ceramics department at the university created these wonderful pots, which are exact replicas of ancient Egyptian pots. So we had the right pots. Now, this is an interesting story. Herodotus says that once they cleaned out, once they evacuated the, the abdominal cavity, now remember you have two cavities. You have your abdominal cavity, a diaphragm, and above it is the thoracic, right? Once they, they evacuate the abdominal cavity, what they did was they washed it with palm wine. Now, that makes sense. You're using an alcohol, right, uh, you know, to, to, to clean it out. And the only place we could get palm wine was in Nigeria, right? Um, and this is strange stuff. Let me show you the. If you look at it, w first we, we saw it said Delta palm wine, and there's a little pyramid on the front. So we took that as a good omen, you know, sort of Egyptian or whatever. But then if you read the label, it says, under the palm wine, it says, shake well for full nutritional value, right? This stuff had all kinds of things in it floating. Uh, so no one drank it, but we used it to, you know, clean out the abdominal cavity. Now let me see. Now let me show you one other thing back. If you look at that little jar, that's the little jar that we're going to pour the wine into the abdominal cavity with, and on it we've put the hieroglyphs for wine. Now that those hieroglyphs are pronounced, and I think it's onomatopoetic. The Egyptians liked words that sounded like they were. For example, the word for donkey in ancient Egyptian is ea. The word for cat is mia. Right? And the word for wine is erp, right? <laughs> like a burp. So it's, I think it's onomatopoetic. I mean, I think intentionally. But so we have the, the wine jar. We have our palm wine. We're about ready to start. Now, we also need our spices. And the Egyptians used frankincense and myrrh. Now, the, the frankincense and myrrh had an important function, I think. It masked the smells. When you're working with an unembalmed cadaver, eventually it's going to smell, perhaps. So you have this frankincense and myrrh, which will rehydrate with the body fluids, and, and it will cover some of, some of the smell. So we got our frankincense and myrrh the same place that the ancient Egyptians did. It came from Yemen, right? From, and on the right is the myrrh. The bigger chunks is the myrrh. On the left is the frankincense, just so you see what it is. So we got ours there, too. We used pure linen. The Egyptians did not have cotton. The ancient Egyptians didn't have cotton. So we had to get pure white linen, untreated linen. Right? That was hard, by the way. Most linen you get in America or anywhere is treated. So we had to go to Ireland to get 100 yards of linen untreated. And then my students put the magical spells. These are, these are ancient Egyptian magical spells that we've written on the bandages, real spells that have been found on mummy bandages. So we're preparing everything for the mummification. Then, again, like I say, we had to create jobs. The ancient Egyptians, when they were buried, wanted to be buried with 365 little statues to serve them in the next world. They're called Ushapti statue. Ushapti is an ancient Egyptian word. It means answerer. 
when you're called to do work in the next world, this guy will answer for you, right? Ushapti statues. So on the top, you can see 365 of these little Ushapti statues that the ceramics department has done. And they've done a rather nice job. They're really quite good. Um, so good that I made sure that they didn't glaze the back because I didn't want them showing up on the antiquities market 100 years from now. Um, and also, we have canopic jars. The ancient Egyptians stored the internal organs. After you remove the organs, you don't throw them out. You keep them because you're literally going to get it all together again in the next world and resurrect. So these are the four canopic jars. And then those are the storage jars on either side. So we've got all the ceramics you need for mummification. We've got the bronze tools, obsidian tools. We've got the linen. We've got the palm wine. We've got frankincense and myrrh. And we need one more thing, an embalmer's board. The Egyptians, when they mummified, had a kind of board. We've only found one, by the way, only one. It was found by the Metropolitan Museum of Art in 1926, I think it was, Winlock, the excavator, and we made an exact copy. Now, we did it with hand tools, same way the Egyptians did it. And one of the things that nobody ever understood about this embalmer's board is why does it have these almost railroad tie, like big, big planks going across it? We figured out why. I'll, I'll tell, you, tell you in a minute. So we're building this embalmer's board, and it snaps together with pegs because the Egyptians didn't have nails. So I'm putting the embalmer's board back together, and the mummy is going to rest on that embalmer's board when we work. Now we are ready, finally, to mummify. Now, the people that you see here in, the, in this, this image is the National Geographic film crew. They were doing this documentary, as I said, on the, on the project. And they were very nice people, right? very nice people, but I wouldn't do it again with them. Um, they, they sort of didn't get it that you can only do it once. You know, so like, can we do that again? No, it only has one brain. You, know, you only take out one brain once, and you can only do that. Um, and I was a little worried also about the cameraman. Um, this, this is the producer, actually, here. The cameraman's in, in behind. Um, this is the producer, and the cameraman is, is behind her. Um, I was worried that he would be able, he hadn't seen, I asked him, had you been ever at an anatomical dissection? Have you seen any surgery? No. Um, and I asked him, are you going to be okay in the, in the OR room when I work on this thing? And he said, yes, because he's looking through a camera, and it sort of gives you a distance. And he was right. I mean, he's had no problem at all, but it, it makes it different. Um, you become a viewer rather than a participant, perhaps. So anyway, they were very nice people, but they didn't fully understand what was going on. Anyway, um, I'm about to break in through the nose, right? We have our, our, our cadaver is draped, just like in surgery. Only the nose is, is revealed there. And I've got that long harpoon-like thing, and I'm going to tap it to go right through the cribriform plate, past the ethnoid, and into the cranium, right? That was easy. Now we're about to take out the brain. I've got that long hook-like thing in the nose. And this is where we realized, actually we realized from the two severed heads that I worked on, that you just don't pull it out. The brain doesn't come out. It's not solid enough. It's, it's, it's not viscous enough. Um, what we realized was we had to put the instrument inside through the, through the nasal passage, but then we rotated it like a whisk, like a kitchen whisk, and liquefied the brain. Then we inverted the cadaver, and the brain runs out kind of like a strawberry milkshake. I mean, it comes out like that. So that's, that's how they did it, I'm sure. And you know, this also explains why nobody's ever found the remains of a brain. It doesn't come out in any condition. You can keep it. It's, it's just a liquid. So it was, it was discarded, um, which, which, by the way, isn't totally crazy. You know, the Egyptians didn't believe that you thought with your brain. The Egyptians believed that you thought with your heart. Because when you get excited, it's your heart that beats quickly, not your brain. Right? I mean, so it's not counterintuitive at all to think, no, the brain doesn't, isn't what you think with. You think with your heart. This is why in the Bible, for example, we get phrases like, Pharaoh's heart was hardened. Right? Or on Valentine's Day, you know, you send little chocolate hearts, right? But you should be selling little chocolate brains. Right? <laughs> right? I mean, if you're talking about your feelings, your thoughts. Um, but anyway, we're going to remove the brain this way. We rotate it like a whisk, invert it. Now, how do we know when we've got all the brain out? We, we have to evacuate the cranial cavity completely. We have to get all the brain out. What we figured was we would, after we invert the cadaver, we would take linen strips and force them with the tool through the nasal passage into the cranial cavity and use it like a swab. And then we'll pull it out. It'll come out with some blood, with some body fluids on it, some gray matter. And you would keep replacing the, the linen until it comes out clean. And then you know you've gotten all the brain out. That must be how they did it. So we did that. I mean, this is, so this is, you can see I've got the, the linen coming out. 
right? And, and then eventually you keep doing it until you get a clean, right? So now we've got the brain out, the hard part, right? The, the, what we think is the hard part. At this point, we said, let's break for lunch. And, and the National Geographic crew sort of looked, you know. And, and, and there's this great place two blocks away from the medical school, which, which has crab cakes, Maryland crab cakes, right? Um, and so we went there, you know. It's kind of like a hole in the wall place, but it's really good crab cakes. And, and, and all the National Geographic team ordered salad. It was really funny. <laughs> Everyone ordered salad. But anyway, um, so we came back to finish the mummification. Now, the next thing we did was remove the internal organs. Now, Herodotus again gives us some nice details that we don't have anywhere else. Herodotus said, a man called the slitter, the slitter, right, the surgeon, so to speak, comes and marks a red line on the body, which is where to cut. And then he comes with his obsidian tool, makes the slit, and then they say, and then he ran away because they threw stones at him. Now, this is a ritual, but what it is is anybody who defiles a human body is doing something wrong. Now, of course, he's trying to help preserve the body. So this is just a ritual. They would take pebbles and throw them at him, and he would run away after he's done his slitting, right? So we did the, this is the red mark on the left's flank, you know. And remember, we've looked at lots of mummies. We've seen what the incision looks like. We know where it goes. We're also going from Herodotus, tomb paintings, and actual mummies. So we're about to do the abdominal cavity. There you can see it's only three inches. Now, I wondered, can you get a liver which is the largest organ in your body. Right? The liver is the largest internal organ. The largest organ is your skin. Right? The skin is an organ. But the largest internal organ is the liver. And it's big. It's bigger than most people realize. Like your liver, an average healthy liver, will fill your two hands. More than that. More than that. It's quite, quite large. Can you get a liver out, out of a three, three, you know? Can you do it? Well, we're going to learn. So I'm making the incision, right? Now, I've got my obsidian tool, just a piece of leather around it so I don't cut myself. It's very sharp. And I make a little gentle incision, and I'm down to the level of the adipose tissue. I'm, you, we've got a little bit of fat, right? That's, you're looking at a little white, a little fat. And then one more swipe, and I'm in the abdominal cavity. Now, that is the first organ that comes out. One of the things we wanted to find out was in what organ, you know, what organs come out first? You know, what's the order in which the organs come out? Um, anybody here can identify that organ? What is it? Nope, good. It looks a little like a kidney, but no. Spleen, spleen. It's a spleen. The spleen, it's, it's a dark, dark red color that'll help you. The spleen is basically a bag of blood. It, it purifies the blood. Right, so the spleen, that's the spleen. That was the first organ that came out. We are trying to learn as much as we can about surgical procedures, what organs come out first, about the tools used, which are the best tools, about the use of natrin. All of this is, is towards answering questions about these areas. So we know now the spleen comes out first. And that's the spleen, a, a, a much neglected organ, I feel, right? When everybody asks ask people to name organs, they're going to go with stomach, liver, kidneys, intestines. Nobody mentions spleen. Now, we are now working on the intestines. We're taking out the intestines. Now, my coworker here is Ron Wade. Ron Wade is the um, director of the State Anatomy Board for Maryland. And Ron was a perfect, perfect coworker. The guy is a great anatomist, knows more anatomy than I would ever know, but even more important, you know, because we all know where the liver is, the kidney is, the, the spleen. He's small. Ron has small hands, and he could get in places where my big clumsy hands couldn't, and he was really very good at getting way up and getting the, the, the you know, get, getting the lungs out, things like that. He did the harder of, of, the, uh, of the surgical techniques, so that's Ron Wade, and we're taking out the intestines, right? Now, our cadaver had died in the hospital after a stroke, and he had been on the IV for a few days. So his lower GI tract was pretty much empty. So we, we got lucky. We didn't have a messy thing, but we still tied off the internal organ, you know, the, 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 you know, the intestines, and took them out that way. And now we're putting the organs inside jars, preserving them. Right? And I'm putting natrin on top of the organs to dehydrate them. Right? Now, how much natrin does it take? The answer is... 400 pounds for a single mummification of an ordinary sized man, it took 400 pounds of natrin. Now that gives you an idea of how expensive it was to mummify in the ancient Egyptian way. Now we're doing it top of the line. We're not sparing any expense. We are mummifying the way a pharaoh would have been mummified, but still, 400 pounds. 
we are now purifying the abdominal cavity with the wine, right? And then, following what we've seen with mummies, we have little packets of natron. We have taken the, 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 the sodium carbonate, bicarbonate, and chloride, right, the, the baking soda and, and table salt, and put them in a little packets of, 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 na- of linen, making kind of like a sachet, and we are going to pack the abdominal and thoracic cavities with natron. We are going to dehydrate the body both from the inside and the outside simultaneously. Right? Now, it took 22 packets of natron right, to go all the way up. We've cut the diaphragm. We've gone all the way up. We've taken out the, we've taken out the lungs, stomach, liver, spleen, kidneys, intestines, right? pancreas, gallbladder. And by the way, you know, a lot of people think because the Egyptians did mummification that they had a great, great knowledge of anatomy. Wrong. You don't learn anatomy by sticking your hand in a little slit and pulling out an organ. No way. Most of the anatomy the Egyptians knew they learned from animals that they slaughtered, which isn't the same as a human. Um, As a matter of fact, for example, there is no ancient Egyptian word for gallbladder. I don't think they knew you had one. They just didn't see it. I didn't see it. When I was doing the mummification, I'm taking things out. I'm, 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 I'm operating, right? And I know a little anatomy. And I'm pulling it out, and I said to Ron, Ron, where's the gallbladder? And Ron, my, my coworker Ron said, oh, it came out with the mesentery. It came out with the intestines. I didn't see it. It was just lost in that tangle of tubes that looks like your intestines. So they didn't have a great knowledge of anatomy. They didn't. So we're packing everything with natron. We're going to dehydrate it from the inside and the outside. This is our embalmer's board, if you'll remember. And this is where we found out why the railroad ties are there. When you die, the only thing that affects where the blood is in your body is gravity. Your heart has stopped beating. It is no longer circulating the blood. This is why, for example, in a cadaver, when you cut a cadaver, it doesn't bleed a lot because there's nothing pumping the blood. So, for example, if you stood a body, a murder victim, up in a closet, the blood would go to the legs. If he's lying down, it's going to go to the larger muscle groups, your gluteus maxima, your butt, your quadriceps, right? All of that. So what we figured out was, since all the blood is going to go to the bottom of the cadaver that's lying on the board, that's where you need the natron to absorb the moisture. We didn't drain the body. We figured we could do it without. So when we filled up the board with natron, those railroad ties, you can see, are keeping the natron in place. It's giving you a lot of natron under the body. It doesn't squirt out. And then the body's going to go on top of that. Now, we are working inside a tent. Now, the reason we're working inside a tent is because the Egyptians mummified in a tent. One of the names for Anubis, the mummifier god, is he who is in his tent. Another name for Anubis is he who is upon his hill. And we believe the Egyptians mummified outdoors on a hill so the smells would be blown away by the wind. Now, we couldn't do that outdoors. We're doing it at the medical school, but we built a little tomb-like sort of Tent, we'd actually built a tent, there's a tent, and we kept the, the temperature at 105 degrees. So we are working at 105 degrees with 22% humidity, like Egypt, right? like Egypt. And we are filling with natron, the board, and the, the body is on the board now. I think you can make out the foot just to orient you. The internal organs are in the jars around the mummification table. And in the back, that little circular thing is telling us the humidity and temperature. So we are going to leave the body, our unembalmed cadaver, on this mummification board covered in natron for for 70, well, for 35 days we're going to start with, 35 days, because that's what some texts talk about, 35 days. So we're going to leave them there and see what happens. We didn't peek. We decided to just close the door, walk away, and hope it works. Right? We have removed the organs. We've done everything the Egyptian way. But we didn't know if this would work. Nobody had done it in 2,000 years. And we could have been stuck with a rotting cadaver. And we just didn't know. After about a week, we were pretty sure we were OK. Because a rotting cadaver really smells. It putrefies. And we didn't get a bad smell. We really didn't. So I thought we were OK. But we weren't sure. After 35 days, we go back. And that's what it looks like. The natron is no longer powdery. It's congealed. It's almost as hard as cement. 
but it comes off. You know, you can hit it a little bit, and it comes off. That's the mummy's head, right? You can, you can see where it is. Nose is there, eye. So what was curious was, another thing we wanted to know, why does a mummy look like it does? Is it the result of 3,000 years? Or is it the result of the mummification process? The answer is the mummification process. After 35 days, our mummy looked like a mummy, looked like an Egyptian mummy. There's the mummy's hand. It sounds like a, mu a, a, a mummy movie, right? The mummy's hand is emerging. We're, we're dusting it off. We're, we're getting rid of the natron. Now, this is the mummy, the head, looking from the head. And you can see there's some yellow there. That's lipids, fats. There is, it's, it's, it's very interesting what happened to our mummy after 35 days. And this is where we learned so much. After 35 days, let me give you one more view of our mummy here. We're, we're now checking him out. We're brushing him off. Looks like an Egyptian mummy with one difference, one difference. There's still a little bit of liquid in him. We could feel it in the larger muscle groups, the gluteus maximus, the butt, the legs. We could feel a little bit of softness. Now, we didn't know what to do. Was our mummy going to decay because there was moisture in it? Should we put more natron on and dehydrate it more? Or should we put it back in the tomb, the, the little tent, and see what happens? Right? Now, we, before we decided, we weighed our mummy. Now, the mummy went in weighing 180 pounds. It came out weighing about 60 pounds. So, as you know, you're mostly water. And when you remove the organs, too, you're really lightening. So, so it came out at about 60 pounds, right? Still, there was some moisture in there. Still quite a bit of moisture. But we decided, and these are the organs. This is what the organs look like after 35 days. There's your kidneys in the middle. The kidneys are right in the middle. Um, we decided to wrap him. Just a kind of preliminary wrapping and put him back in the tomb for another three months just to see what would happen. We'd learn more. So he's wrapped. Now, that's not blood that you see, those stains on the, on the bandages. That's resin, tree sap, that we used, just as the Egyptians did, to adhere the bandages. So you want to stick the bandages on. So I'm using tree resin here, and I'm wrapping him just kind of preliminarily. Put him back for three months, and let's see if he decays or if he comes out lighter. And there were... This is what he looks like after another three months. He's lighter. He weighs now about 38 pounds. So the rest of the moisture is gone. And this is where we really learned. It didn't happen the way we thought. We believed that the whole goal of mummification is to get rid of all the moisture real fast. And we thought we had failed, perhaps, because after 35 days, we still had moisture in our body, right? No. Here's what happened. We had decided to bury our pharaoh like, I'm sorry, bury our mummy like a pharaoh. We were going to put his arms on his chest, you know, like Tutankhamun. And when we tried to do that, after three months, we couldn't. He was too brittle. We would have broken the arms. Now, if we had done it after 35 days, we could have done that. There's a little bit of moisture left. So the reason the Egyptians said 35 days was it's just long enough that enough moisture is gone that it won't decay, and there's still enough moisture in it that you can have flexibility and bandage it any way you want. So we couldn't do that because we put it back for another three months. What we did was we buried the arms in this position with, it, with the hands down by the pubis, and that way you know, we, we, could, we could bandage them pretty, pretty, pretty nicely. So we're wrapping them now. And that's our mummy wrapped. This is what he looks like, all wrapped like a pharaoh. Now, we are about to CAT scan him. And let me emphasize that this is an ongoing project and why we did it. First, remember I said we wanted to learn about tools that were used? We learned a lot about that. We learned about the embalming board. We learned why there were railroad ties. We learned about the stone implement, the knife, that why they used the stone knife. We learned all kinds of things about that. And that was very successful. We learned about the natron. We learned that you put the packets inside and outside, 400 pounds. That dehydrates the body. And we even learned that you can put it in for 35 days, and that's just right to keep a little moisture in and to dehydrate most of the body. So we did a lot of that. Now, the other thing we wanted to do is scan our mummy to get a set of CAT scans of our mummy. Now, why? 
our mummy is the only ancient Egyptian mummy about whom we know everything that was done to it. We know we went in bilaterally through both nostrils. We know how the brain was removed. We know that natron packets were put inside the, the thoracic and abdominal cavities. We know all of this. So now when anybody finds an ancient Egyptian mummy, a real ancient Egyptian mummy, our mummy is the benchmark. They can compare our x-rays, CAT scans with theirs to see, oh yes, that's like, the, that's like their mummy at Maryland. They, they did that with the two things. Ours looks just like that. Nope, ours doesn't look like that. They didn't do it that way. So ours is a bit of a kind of yardstick against which other mummies can be compared. So we, we CAT scanned them. And there we are looking at the scans. I'll tell you an interesting thing, though. I don't know if anybody knows this. Here's a, here's a mummy trivia question for you. You can CAT scan a mummy. You can x-ray a mummy. But you can't do an MRI of a mummy. Does anybody know why? Is any radiologist in the... It's a tricky question. You've got to know how, how MRIs work. Okay. It's not blood. It's, there's no moisture. See, an MRI works off of the hydrogen off of the hydrogen in the water molecules. You need water in a, in, a, in a subject to do an MRI. If you took our mummy and put him in an MRI, you'd get no signal at all. You would get nothing, as if nothing's there. So you can't do an MRI of a mummy. But we did the CAT scans, so we have all of that. Now, as I mentioned at the very beginning of the talk, this is an ongoing project. It is not, let me show you just one more. Yeah. There he is going in. Now, do you see that we have a foot open? There's a foot unwrapped. We've unwrapped it later. This is a later scan. We, we want to take tissue samples periodically to see if our mummy is, is, is decaying. Every two years or so, we go back. We take tissue samples. We culture it. We look to see if there's any bacteria, fungi. So far, it seems to, to be stable. It's, it's, nothing's, nothing's growing on our mummy, inside or out. Uh, we put endoscopes in. We look to see what's going on. Uh, we think we got it right, but you, know, you have to wait a while, you know, a couple thousand years to see if it's right. But this is our foot, just so, so we can take samples if we want. And this is what the mummy looks like today, right? After each time we, we unwrap, we look, and it, it, it is in room temperature. It's at room temperature, and it has been for 14 years, and so far there's no signs of decay. Now, as I was going to say, you know, it's an ongoing project. We are asked very often for samples of tissue by other scientists doing work with mummies. But maybe more important, we are doing DNA studies on our mummy right now. And, and you mentioned, Elizabeth, there's an IMAX film. I forget what it was called. Was it Secrets of the Mummies? Yeah, Secrets of the Pharaohs. Um, this was an IMAX. I don't know if any of you saw it. It was an IMAX about our research with this mummy. And, it, it, and what it is is an honest film. It tells you that so far, nobody has been able to get any DNA out of an ancient Egyptian mummy. It's all hype on television. It's not true when they say, oh, the DNA is going to reveal that this is Queen Hatshepsut. No. We have not been able to get a long sequence of DNA from any Egyptian mummy, and we're not sure why. Is it 3,000 years? Is it the mummification process? Is it this? Is it that? So what we are doing now, right now, and, it, and we'll know within a few months, is we are sequencing DNA from our mummy. Now, if we can get a long chain of DNA from our mummy, we will know it's the 3,000 years that's the problem and not the mummification. So we're using our mummy to this day in important research, and we hope for the next you know, several centuries, if, we, if, if the University of Maryland goes that long or whatever, that it'll, it'll be available to scientists for other, for other, other procedures. Um, it won't be at the University of Maryland much longer, though, because Ron Wade, my coworker who, who works there, is retiring. And we figure we have to have a better place for it where somebody really cares about mummies. So we're going to give it to the Museum of Man in San Diego, an anthropology museum, which has all kinds of human cadavers, things like that. And they'll, they'll certainly be able to care for it and take care of it. So it'll move to San Diego um, next year. There's going to be a big mummy congress. In, uh, all the mummy experts are getting together in San Diego next year. And then we'll have the mummy there for them to see and do that. So that's when it's you know, going to move. But then we hope it'll be used for future research. But that is the mummy project. Um, and I'll be happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you.